Yo, what? Fancy seeing you here, Ryan. I know, right? I just saw the agenda. I was like, oh, Liz is coming. You might want to uh, tilt your camera. Yeah, it's, man, I don't know what happened. Like, it used to, you know, stick fine, and now it just it moves, it has a mind of its own. Oops, I meant to turn that off. Oh, Daniel, are you in Indiana? Uh, I am in New York. Wait, can you hear? Yeah, uh, I'm in New York, but I went to Purdue. Oh, that's are you in Indiana? I'm in uh, Oakland, but I went to IU. Ah, amazing, amazing. I'm from Indiana, though. Yeah, where are you from? I'm from uh, Fishers. So just oh, like, of course, right? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, got a lot of friends from there. Yeah, I imagine that for you. Yeah, yeah. Overrepresented, for sure. Yeah. Hi, folks. Uh, good morning. I think I live. Welcome. Hey <laughs> Thanks for joining in. We're super excited to have you today, and I think we're going to wait a few minutes for Matt to join in as well as um, some of the others joining in. How's everyone? Good. Good, good, good. Too. Ryan, how are you? Doing all right. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> super excited. Again, uh, kind of spread the word across different channels, but... Uh, Takes a while for folks to join in. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for joining, Steve. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not too worried if it's a small group. Um, I actually uh, figured I would do this more as a little bit of a chalk talk rather than having fancy slides and like expecting to be presenting to a bunch of people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's why Liz, you're always a great speaker. <laughs> so. Any any format is that's totally true, cool. but also the slides are a, are a substantial part of the polish. So this is a little bit more rough and raw, but that's fine. Good, good. It's good for oh, discussion also. That's perfect. Exactly. What I figured is, you know, like small audience, you know, I know you all, and like this, you know, we're we're all uh, people who work <laughs> in this space as opposed to uh, necessarily audiences who are like, what is this observability thing anyway? I know exactly. But I think it. I think it is great that you know, Liz, uh, you and the and charity and the team did the book uh, because I think that the book actually is very helpful for engineers, you know, who are getting involved in 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 actually building out observability into their applications and and just understanding, you know, um, the the basic concepts and advanced concepts. <laughs> so good stuff. And, and, you know, really thank you for making the book available online because I think that's always a great game changer for, you know, folks to pick up. The thing that's knowledge. really surprising to me is that despite making the book or maybe because of making the book available for free online, um, O'Reilly has said that it's one of their better selling books. Uh, for, oh, fantastic. For this quarter. Um, I think it so. really helps actually because people have a chance to kind of read through it and then they're like, oh, okay, I can mark up my book, you know, so let me get a paper copy too. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that the formalization of, uh, you know, structured events as, you know, a thing <laughs> that that that's 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 actually defined um, is another great addition of the book, you know, especially that it's complemented uh, with more pragmatic, practical advice about, you know, how to actually employ this to humans. <laughs> great, because that, uh, <laughs> yeah, that turns out to be one of one of the things I, that I wanted to talk about today is kind of how awesome. I came around to, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about how I came around to structured events because I was a very hardcore metrics person at Google. Um, <laughs> yeah. Also, um, fair warning, like I am, I am going to break my rule uh, about, <laughs> about saying, about saying, you know, when I was Google, we dot, dot, dot. Um, I try not to do it. I have a swear jar from when I do it at Honeycomb. Um, but, 
but here it's like for setting historical context, not a you should do this because we did it at Google. So I, I think it's okay, but give me a little bit of rope there. <laughs> yes, totally, totally. Sure. always, Liz. Um, did you already uh, do the disclaimer, uh, Elolita? I joined a minute late. The TOC meeting uh, ran two minutes late. Uh, so. I, I introduced, uh, just said hi and I welcomed everyone, but uh, Matt, okay. happy to. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a CNCF sponsored <laughs> event. As such, the CNCF's code of conduct. Uh, applies, please don't do anything in chat uh, or anything on the, in, in the meeting that would be in violation of that. Um, I have a few things to briefly cover that are more administrivia that I hope to kind of blow through and there's links and follow-up can happen after. Uh, uh, Liz, I'm not sure how much time you want to fill, but I did want to leave the bulk of the time for, for, you, for your talk. Um, again, I love that it's, uh, you know, for practitioners, so impromptu and not super um, not slideware or architecture is actually a, a, an advantage here. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, um, okay, uh, so I can share my screen briefly just to if anybody's following along later. Um, Great, go go for it, Matt. At least not see your screen right. yet. Can you? Can everybody see? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, cool. Um, so today uh, in the TLC meeting that's just prior to this meeting by one hour. Um, is my mic level okay? This is a brand yeah, new mic. Okay, totally, cool. totally. Um, it's fine. Right. So the TOC has asked us to uh, the tag, you know, and the tag chairs and whoever else is interested, I suppose, uh, reach out um, to, to kind of assess the health of the Cortex project um, uh, and make some concrete recommendations about what I might need. Uh, so there's a link there. Um, at long last, I think it's a year and running, we, we now have a logo <laughs> uh, and we're getting the actual high res SVGs. Um, from uh, the CNCF creative folks. Um, <clears throat> I want to highlight something, uh, you know, I kind of, I went, I, I went and visited tag security last week um, uh, to talk about the landscape graph, uh, which I don't want to get into the details of here, uh, but um, uh, for time, uh, but there are links um, as they have a working group on secure supply chain. And why does this matter for observability, right? Well, <laughs> you know, when, when we build things and they bring in all kinds of dependencies, um, not only are there impacts to performance and, and runtime and all that, but from a security perspective, part of our charter is to help with the comprehension and observation of cloud native workloads, including what CVEs might be there, you know, as of this morning or last week. Um, and so uh, the part of that graph project that is defining the data model for packages, NPM, Brew, Deb, or, you know, et cetera, um, all, of the, all of the packages, um, they have a similar effort going on. Uh, in 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 some collaborations outside the CNCF uh, with with other uh, open source and other Linux Foundation affiliated groups. Um, in addition, uh, they've kind of proposed a similar graph project that's more at requirements uh, phase. And so there's some overlap. And so some there's some collaboration here that could happen uh, between tag observability uh, and tag security. Uh, they actually call themselves S tag. And there's some debate as to which, as to whether we should call ourselves O tag, but th that's probably something for Slack uh, and a poll. Um, uh, and then uh, it looks like uh, da, 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 that's all I had in the way of, uh, you know, administrative stuff. Um, I'm assuming Ryan, uh, do you want to talk to uh, the next item, OTEP for profiling? Yeah, I can uh, just uh, briefly give like an update of what's going on there. Um, so basically a couple weeks ago, um, they merged, I guess like the, you know, open telemetry merged this, uh, project management guidelines. So there's, there's a bunch of, um, you know, yeah, there's like a bunch of different efforts around various kinds of specifications and that kind of thing. And so they wanted to create a more sort of standardized process for like, you know, the, the different check boxes you need to check in what order you need to check them. And so um the the main ones that they uh you know that they say is like sort of the the minimal set of criteria that you need is uh one a group of designers or subject matter experts or just you know people generally generally um you know i guess like somewhat interested and qualified and uh ready to dedicate some time into working on the project and so We've already sort of established that we have a lot of people from a lot of different 
um, you know, uh, some open source projects, some vendors, some end users. So we have like a good mix of people there. Um, and then the second one is the TC needing to be aware. Um, as of oh, last week or two weeks ago, we got our second TC member uh, to like sponsor the, the working group, the efforts there. And so, um, you know, obviously they're aware. And then the third one is that the spec approvers in the broader community need to be aware of progress being made. And so that's the one that we are currently working on. Um, I actually also just got out of there uh, the specification SIG, SIG? Yeah, they call them SIG still, I think, or TAG, whatever it is, the specification. It's the, it's the SIG. Yeah, it, yeah. It's SIGs. Anything CNCF level is a TAG, anything project level is a SIG. Yeah, okay. that's confusing. So yeah. Kubernetes is SIGs, OTEL is SIGs, but uh, yeah. CNCF has TAGs. Hope that helps. Yeah, yeah. So I just got out of that meeting. Um, and so, yeah, so we're now, um, and I put a link into the uh, doc, which we are still in the process of finalizing, but um, Basically, yeah, we're we're um, you know in kind of the final stages of getting that first um, you know uh, checkbox is done where this becomes an official thing, um, and then after that, the next steps are creating a project tracking issue, a project board, which we actually kind of got a little bit of a head start there as we've already started talking about um, sort of uh, more um, uh, I guess like the writing actual code for this, you know, instead of just talking about, we've talked a lot qualitatively about all of the different pieces of um, all the different ways you can collect profiling data and the different formats that different, um, you know, companies and projects are using. And so uh, we've already started to figure out what the qualitative metrics that we'd like, or sorry, quantitative metrics we'd like to have are um, in terms of like, you know, benchmarking, stuff like that. And so, um, basically, I think things should, um, we should be able to move pretty uh, steadily, hopefully quickly as that happens. Um, but in the meantime, um, we're finishing up this official spec and presenting it to the specifications um, group. And then, uh, and then, yeah, we'll go from there. So that's the update on that. Um, the last section that I guess needs the most filling in, and you know, it's kind of something, it's not something that's meant to be like done by any means, but you know, we can always continue to add to it. But uh, the last section that we're still sort of working on is the different use cases for profiling. Um, and um, yeah, so just FYI, that group meets on every other Thursday. So not this Thursday, but the one following is the next meeting there. Um, so if anybody would like to join, feel free to join. Um, otherwise, uh, check out the doc and let me know if you have any feedback, thoughts, questions, or feel free to just comment in the doc. Cool, Ryan. And, and can we, we can just add our comments to the doc, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool, cool. Thanks. The, it uh, really uh, looks good. The doc has come a long way, I think. Your uh, and thank you to everyone that's contributed to it. I mean, I don't, Brian probably has the actual account. Uh, I added a little section at the bottom, but you know, if you've had a hand in this and there's usually double digits of people that have um you know make sure we add our name on hotel definitely i mean that's the great thing about the project that you know a lot of folks do contribute and read the docs and really provide good feedback so thank you everyone yep yep and uh oh yeah and then i guess i didn't mention the um yeah kind of the the structure that we went with there so we we used the um I mean, obviously, a lot of the um, the signals are similar, and so we kind of use the structure from the logs proposal from a while back, um, and then kind of merge that with the various like vision statements, mission and vision statements from Otel itself, um, and sort of like combine those to create kind of the outline for this, and then sort of filled it in that way. So. Um, you know, yeah, so we really tried to be intentional about having it align with the overall goals of Otel, Otel as well. Um, so yeah, also just FYI on how we sort of came up with the points we came up with. Um, the following docs after this will be sort of more, you know, now every doc after this will get a little bit more into the weeds, um, you know, what specific, you know, uh, what specific 
fields do we want to have in the you know in the profiling format stuff like that will will be the future documents but for now this one's meant to be more just like high level to make sure everybody's on the same page with regards to to what the goals are and that kind of thing awesome yeah i've i've put a link in um last toc meeting uh we talked about this specifically and in, in the slide there if you're curious about the actual meeting notes and whatever um, there, there's jumping off link points there as well. Um, so we've been socializing all of this and um, really trying to get consensus prior to a formal thing. And it seems to be working. Um, so nice. All right. Well, that's all I got. Uh, similarly, I think uh, the rest of the time is yours, uh, Liz. Um, you said 20 or 30 minutes, and I think that'll take us to time. So um, thank you again for joining. Um, us here, if folks aren't familiar, I'll hold it up once more. Everyone probably is here. Um, there's a new O'Reilly book out uh, with, uh, by, with Liz and Charity and George. Uh, with that, uh, I'll say, um, and, and stay tuned for uh, a PR actually to formalize this, but we're, we're hoping to have a speaker series uh, you know, through the fall uh, to see what happens. Uh, and we'll have a process to propose speakers. Um, you know, we're starting with authors. Um, so there's a couple of books that have come out. This is one of them. Uh, and, and you know, we hope to make uh, this talk, uh, you know, feedback from domain experts and practitioners, um, which is obviously in our charter and relevant. So uh, Liz is the first speaker. Um, and we hope- You didn't tell me that I was going to be your first guinea pig. Oh, that's exciting. Okay, cool. <laughs> Test subject. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, we, oh, we you're, about you're, a, all, you're a rock star here, Liz. <laughs> so thank you for joining in. Basically, what I wanted to talk about today is how I came to where I am on this journey of thinking about signal types and kind of what our objectives are in observability and how we can best realize them and what I think is up is up ahead. Um, so. I've been working as a site reliability engineer of some kind for the past, um, let's say, uh, 17 years now. Uh, 17 or so, 17, 18 years sounds about right. Um, I started started doing this when I was very, very young, when I was uh, 17 years old, um, and I cut my teeth. Uh, really trying to solve problems that we wouldn't necessarily think of as systems engineering or systems administrative problems. Um, I actually started off as a, um, what you could, I guess, describe as an abuse analyst um, at a game studio. Um, so basically I was scraping through logs um, using, using grep and awk and all of those things to try to identify patterns of people who are cheating at our game. And Today, we might include that in the broader observability umbrella, right? Like it is a user pattern that we're trying to detect using the signals that we have. But unfortunately, the signals that we had were not very, were not particularly good. Um, but what's really interesting is that you can start to see kind of the similarities with what, with what I do today um, and, and, and the differences, right? Like the similarities are that I'm trying to identify unknown patterns caused by my users in my code. Um, without necessarily having foreknowledge of, of what these users are trying to do. But the way that I solved it at the time was there would be, you know, various log entries sprinkled, right? Like there was a log entry whenever someone finished a gameplay session. So we could detect, you know, how often per user is, is a gameplay session being, being concluded. What's the duration per user of, of those gameplay sessions? So we're able to, you know, with clever use of, of set and awk and grep, we're able to produce these like interesting command line, right? Like text, text uh, histograms that showed some users were completing, um, were completing hundreds or thousands of play sessions in the amount of time that it would take a normal user, you know, to complete like 10 play sessions. So that was kind of that first exposure to what I didn't realize at the time was kind of a high cardinality problem, right? Where there are many, many thousands of users who may be logged into the game at any time doing, you know, tens of thousands of different play sessions. How do we sift that, sig that signal from the noise? So fast forward about another five years um, and I had joined Google at this point. Um, and this was kind of my first exposure to what 
you know, best practices look like, what kind of doing things in anger at scale look like. And what's interesting is that the tools were different from, uh, were, were very different from what I did in my game studio job, right? Like I was not necessarily going to be using uh, grepping through logs. Um, that was a thing that did not work at Google scale. Um, what Google had really embraced at, at the time, even as of when I joined in, in 2008, was this idea that everything should be recorded as a time series metric because there's just going to be too much data to record to centrally index. And you would use uh, your metrics, which were potentially broken down by machine, um, and then by job, and then by and then by data center and availability zone, and all of these varying things, right? Like you could use metrics essentially to do what I eventually formalized as the idea of binary searching the potential problem space, right? Like that if we were seeing a high rate of HTTP 500 or high rate of latency, what we would wind up doing is we'd wind up finding a number of different dimensions to break down by, right? Like maybe it's availability zone, maybe it's kernel version, right? Like I'm going to see, I'm going to you know keep on plugging in these values that I want to group by to see where all the lines simultaneous, right, where one line spikes and the other lines don't, right? Like that's kind of how you bisect um, where the problem is coming from inside of your systems. And sometimes it was sufficient to bisect it down to, okay, right, like, you know, what we would think of today as, as a particular uh, Kubernetes pod template spec, right? Like that once, once you know that it's a particular deployment ID that is all exhibiting this problem or a particular availability zone that's all exhibiting this problem, that would then enable us to say, okay, let's, you know, let's cordon that off, right? Like let's, let's drain the bad availability zone that's clearly having some issues or let's revert that bad release that's clearly having some issues. What's interesting is at Google, there was not necessarily the notion of caring about high cardinality in users. Basically, the idea was any problem is going to, you know, oh, that's an impossible problem, right? Like you, you would never want to, you know, for both privacy and, and technical reasons, you, you would never want to group by individual Google search user. That's just impossible. It was kind of the thinking at the time. But sometimes the metrics were not sufficient. Um, in particular, the metrics were not sufficient in two different ways. First of all, the metrics were not uh, sufficient when you had issues of noisy neighbors, when you had issues of crashes and single machines, um, where you could tell that an abnormally high error rate was coming from a specific set of machines, but not necessarily, your metrics were not sufficient. And what I found interesting was that there, yes, you would fall back onto logs, but the logs were not centrally indexed. That we would go and we would, um, you know, not SSH the machine, but we would go and pull up a log viewer that would scrape the, the files off of the individual machine to go, and, to go and look at them, right? And that would kind of enable us to have this rolling circular buffer of logs that we could go, go, to, go to if we desperately needed, but that it was not a signal that we relied upon uh, kind of for our bread and butter work. It was kind of only if, all, if everything else has failed. But there's another interesting problem, which is what about the problems that do not appear as kind of single point sources of failure? Or what about problems where you don't know what to filter or group by? Because there were millions of metrics at Google. And I think one of the fascinating things that I uncovered there and kind of what pointed me down this path of tracing was when I, saw, when I saw for the first time, um, we had a black box probing service um, that would basically uh, repeatedly hit the service I was responsible for at the time, which was uh, Bigtable, one of Google's core storage systems. And what it would do was basically, it would say, always trace this request. I'm going to call out to Bigtable. I'm going to issue a read request, a write request against a special, you know, against a special table that's inserted into this, uh, in, into the, into this uh, tenant in order for us to be able to perform uh, read and write tests against that one table. And that was set to always trace. And we were getting very high quality data out of that, out of that. That would tell us no matter what, for these kind of for these black box probes that were issuing, you know, multiple times per second, where did it get stuck? You know, is the request slow because it got stuck in the underlying file system layer? Is the request slow because it got stuck talking to a particularly bad uh, bad bad uh, shard? 
These were all things that we could identify by looking at the individual failing probe. So that was really neat. But I think one of the challenges was what happens if you have request comes in from a user saying, hey, the, you know, the, the big table slow, but it's not something that was necessarily forced to trace on. How are you going to find that request? How are you going to find the needle in the haystack of a request that looks like that one that is, that is traced? Because if it was not a black box probe, if it was not something that you're manually forcing on, again, problems with Google scale, we're we are sampling one for 100,000. We're sampling one for a million, right? Like, so it's like, okay, you're looking for a P99 latency event that is also one in a million sample rate. That means that it's a one in a hundred million chance that any individual request is going to be both slow and traced. Shit. Okay. So this is where we finally get to the idea of trace exemplars of by this point, um, the folks at Google had, had, had designed a second generation metric storage system. Um, so we originally had this thing called Borgmon that was, you know, very similar to and kind of inspired Prometheus, right? So it's kind of this idea of, okay, right, if you've got a pool-based protocol that goes ahead and, you know, scrapes, uh, scrapes a, a bunch of key value pairs out of, out of a host. We're all very familiar with this format. But what was interesting and different about Monarch, the next generation system, was that it was designed to be able to propagate additional information be besides the key value pairs. For instance, it had a native histogram type. And not only did it have a native histogram type with you know, custom bucket widths and, uh, and various other things to improve resolution, but the folks who designed that system had added the, the idea that you could attach exemplars to your trace buckets to pass on, um, you know, even if you had aggregated away detail to keep some of the aggregated, the, the, uh, the pre-aggregation detail. So for example, if I had a, if I was aggregating a metric on request latency, um, and I was aggregating it at the, uh, at the data center level, I might choose for any specific bucket, um, sorry if this is a recap for people who already know what exemplars are, but right, like for a given bucket, if I was aggregating away the machine ID field, um, because you know that's no longer relevant, I'm 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 uh, I'm just you know combining all of these various machines together into into one aggregate composite uh, latency histogram. We would still keep for every kind of you know 50 millisecond bucket for every uh, for for every minute of scrape, we would keep one example data point, one example host name that had had an event happen matching that criteria in the past minute. And the other really cool thing besides leaving on and not filing off the cardinality of you know, host name or, of, or even of user ID or other things like that, was that we had the idea of attaching traces, trace IDs, right? So you would separately you know, have the decision about whether or not to sample, but if you did choose to sample and you were also in the context of a metric, we would tie together one trace ID that exemplified the, the histogram bucket of the metric and send it along. And when it got post aggregated, you would pick at random one of the trace IDs that might have gotten kept and then, and then propagate that along. So the net result of this was that when you look at a histogram, you could see for the first time trace IDs, or you could see the first, for the first time that higher cardinality detail that you had previously had to file away because it was too it, it was too noisy and to, to create a time series for each individual tag. And this I think was for me the moment where I realized that we don't have to manually correlate all of these things, right? I don't have to keep a correlation ID in my head and then go to the machine and, and, and like grab for that particular correlation ID, right? I don't have to manually, um, you know, look for trace IDs and then see whether the metric spikes at the same time, right? Like, that I could visualize these two things together at the same time. So while I continued to rely pretty heavily upon metrics, kind of the thing that really opened my mind um, in, in, 20, in 2017 was this idea that we can better utilize signal types if they, if they share the same vocabulary, if they share the same verbs and nouns, and we are able to jump fluidly between those signals so that if there is something where we don't have sufficient resolution just from a metric or just from a log, we can, all, we can jump to the relevant piece of context that will help us understand it. 
So when we turned this on for Bigtable, which was the service that I was running at the time, what happened was kind of magical in that we were suddenly able to finally diagnose for the first time. Customer says that their, you know, internal customer says that there's a latency problem in this particular part in this particular partition. Okay, let's graph the latency in this partition. Let's pick an outlier that happens to have a trace associated. Let's zoom in, right? Like let's enhance to, to see what happened. And that, you know, didn't necessarily always immediately give you the answer, but it at least gave you a list of questions to ask, right? Seeing that, oh, all of these high latency points are all being served from the same worker. That suddenly gave you the idea of, okay, maybe I should group by worker to find out whether that's a fluke, right? Whereas previously you would have to magically know that the worker ID was, was the relevant field and dimension to be aware of. Or, you know, if you clicked into a couple of example traces and they all said that the underlying storage system was slow, great, now we know to flip to the storage system uh, dashboard. So that really, really accelerated time to debug um, for, for, for my team, uh, the, the big table SRA team at Google. So I think that brings us to the next question, which is how is it that someone who is, you know, really hardcore into metrics, how does she wind up working at a, at a company that's working on tracing? So I think here's where a couple of things combine. Um, first of all, um, I'd had a number of vigorous Twitter arguments with charity majors over, over, over the years. Um, and we developed a sense of respect for each other rather than the hatred for each other out of that. It's kind of cool to find people that you can disagree with and not get upset at. Um, but I think the other thing was that I'd seen how useful tracing was based off of my example with exemplars. But I was still not necessarily thinking of tracing as a primary data source, right? In my view, what I was thinking in my head was that tracing was, you know, at least at Google scale, it was way too, way too expensive, right? Like that you basically had to sample one for, one for 100,000. How are you going to actually capture any resolution out of that? But it turns out that there are two answers to this. Answer the first, not everyone is Google, right? So just because I say when I was at Google, X was bad does not mean that you should not do X. It just means that at Google scale, you shouldn't do X. Um, but the other important thing is that tracing can have variable sample rates. That was the thing that I had completely missed was that at Google, the tracing systems were actually fairly inflexible, right? Like, you know, you would set a sample rate all across the board, right? Everything had to be sampled, you know, one per 100,000, unless you were manually specifying a specific request to trace through because for instance, it was a black box probe. But it turns out, think about, let's think about this for a second. Let's say I have five events that happen between 200 milliseconds and 250 milliseconds between 9.30 and 9.32 a.m. Let's suppose that one of that that one of them happens to get traced, uh, and I sent and I and I send that through as an exemplar. That means that that one exemplar is representing five events in that histogram bucket. Conversely, if there are a hundred things that took like 50 milliseconds, and you know I might have you know dozens of traces that exemplify that, but I pick only one to exemplify that, and I pass that in the histogram bucket. What we're starting to kind of approach from the exemplars and histograms side is the idea that trace sampling with variable sample rates can produce an approximate histogram. It just so happens that instead of sometimes having no exemplars in a bucket, we might have, you know, we might have one exemplar in a bucket for sure, or there might be two or three exemplars, right? And, and we might just say, okay, you know, there's a sample rate of 50 on this one. There's a sample rate of 20 on this one. So we're just going to add those two numbers together and say that there are 70 total events approximately that meet those criteria. We may not have kept all of them. We may not have kept a precise counter, but statistically over the long term, that that is close enough to be able to generate metric type data out of, out of traces. That really blew my mind, but it suddenly made sense too. Right, that this thing that I had been conceptualizing as, you know, metrics are the primary source of truth. We sometimes use traces. Traces can exemplify particular sets of behavior. 
Instead, its traces exemplify all sets of behavior. We make it cheap enough by sampling. And for a majority of people, sampling one for one or even one for 10 is sufficient. You don't have to go all the way down to one for 100,000, which means that you can get resolution to the nearest 10 plus or minus five, right? Like rather than, than saying, you know, either I get one event, which represents 100,000, or I get zero, right? Like that for most people at most scales, it's actually possible to get higher, higher fidelity than that and still be able to assemble histograms. So once I understood that, I think that kind of really primed me for being able to say, OK, now that I understand that these two data types are very fundamentally similar, it's just a difference in how you conceptualize them, what can we do with this? And the answer is that by keeping traces and by aggregating them at, at read time, it opens up a few possibilities that we couldn't do with metrics. Because metrics pre-aggregate, right? They say, you know, I only want to break down by, by uh, tenant ID. I only want to break down by host name. And it solves a lot of the problems I'd had before of having to correlate, right, to see, did these two lines wiggle at the same time, right? Did the error rate by tenant spike at the same time as the error rate by host name, right? And if they, the two curves exactly match, then I know that those two things are probably at least uh, correlated, if not causated. Whereas if I had the raw data that, that includes the tenant ID and the host name, that I can perform these operations to be able to filter or group by both of the two things simultaneously rather than only one at a time and squinting. So that also meant that a lot of the work that I'd seen done at Google to kind of be able to do this machine learning of do these two curves look the same or, you know, hey, find everything graph that spiked at the same time as this other graph. It rendered a lot of that work redundant, redundant, right? Like because if you have that direct cor correlation there, you no longer need to correlate based on the shapes of things. You can correlate based off of whether two tags are present at the same time in the same object. So I think that this is a moment to step back and say, hey, wait a second. What we're actually grappling with here is not that you know metrics rule, traces rule, or you know traces rule, metrics rule, right? Like. These are all different manifestations of how we visualize the system's data. At the end of the day, events are happening as, as, as our systems process requests. And we can choose to pre-aggregate the events and generate metrics, or we can choose to pass along the detail about each, each event um, and each request flowing through our system and post-aggregate the metrics. But there's still representations of that underlying data that we're trying to express of um, what's happening inside of our systems. And you can do it at varying levels of granularity, right? You can do it at the whole system level. You can do it at the individual service, individual request level. Or you can even think about it at the line of code level, even though like, we know that we can't keep every, requ every request, every single uh, assembly instruction, right? Like that, that, that's, way, that's way too much data if you're keeping 100% of that, right? So I think that trade-off is that the more granular you need to get, the more you need to sample. But no matter how heavily it's sampled, if you have enough samples, you can reconstruct a composite of what happened. And all of this is in service of answering the questions, right? Like who, what, when, where, how, how, why, right? Like th th those are, you know, th those are the questions that we want to answer about our systems. And it does turn out, yes, that some, that some uh, debugging techniques are, are better suited to answer some of those questions. For instance, right, like um, metrics are really great at answering the when question of telling you like, should I be getting out of bed, bed for this, right? And if you're interested in where, right, that, that is a really great place for tracing, right, for tracing to tell you which services to look at or kind of where that gap in time that's unexplained is coming from. And if you're interest, interested in who, that's not a thing that's specific to a signal type. Instead, that's a question of, do you have the ability to group by cardinality, right? Do you have the ability to group by user ID, regardless of which signal you're using? But I think one thing that's really eluded me over the years has been kind of why and how. Because tracing does give us some degree of why and how if the problem is a call to, for instance, to an external resource like a database, right? 
In OpenTelemetry, we generate trace plans for when you call a database. And we even have with SQL Commoner the idea of propagating through to the database to tell you who called you. That way you can uh, trace back you know, who's generating all these very expensive queries. But if the problem is inside of your code, that's not going to get generated trace span. And that's potentially a problem. So one of the realizations I've come to over the past year is that we often need a resolution beyond the uh, request level and beyond just the tags that we attach to the request. That no amount of tagging a request, if the only level of granularity you can get to, the, to the, is the request, is sufficient for being able to understand how and why did that request spin for 2.3 seconds before it called out to the database, right? What happens if the problem is not that the database was slow, but instead that you sat there thinking or maybe blocking on something or waiting on a lock or something, right? Like we don't know, but for some reason, this request stalls for 2.3 seconds. And then it talks to the database for 0.1 seconds and immediately returned, right? What was it doing? And yes, we can wrap this in additional trace bands, but that breaks the fundamental promise of observability. The fundamental promise of observability is that without pushing new code, we should be able to understand any behavior of our system. So the problems that we've solved to date with observability have been kind of chipping away at various angles of, of, these, of these questions, right? Who, what, when, where, why, how. We've chipped away at, at, at needing to push new code to deal, to deal with them, right? If you have adequate ability to debug and diagnose cardinality on the fly, you no longer have to think about who any, or you no longer have to push new code to learn who, great, right? If you have tracing, you no longer need to push new code to, lear to learn where. Right. If if you have uh, if if you have an adequate time series to under to understand like you know when when behavior is happening, right? You don't need to um, say, oh crap, there's a system outage. Well, I better you know turn on the metrics, right? So when is no longer a problem. But yeah, the kind of the the why and the how, I, I think you know either need very high high granularity um, trace spans to be wrapped around every function and kind of turn on on demand with feature flags, right? That's one valid way of doing that. But it turns out there's another answer. The, the other answer is continuous profiling. So this is why a lot of my attention over the past six over the past six to twelve months has been spent on profiling because I think it kind of answers that that holy grail question of which specific line of, of code is causing problems. Which previously, you know, yes, I'd groveled through logs if I happened to have a log statement that that matched what I was looking for. But otherwise, I would have to push new code with a you know log saying I got here. But I think there have been two challenges with regard to profiling adoption. I think challenge the first is that it's in a similar maturity stage as, as tracing was uh, three to four years ago, right? That it was a disconnected signal that people are treating as this kind of completely separate thing that uh, had no relation to what people were working on before. And secondly, that it required a lot of advanced setup um, to collect and to analyze and that it felt to people that, you know, you had to have the entire system, you know, profile or trace really well in order to get any value, right? But I don't necessarily think that that's how we should be thinking about things, right? I, I think that a lot of the previous attempts at tracing failed because we tried to say, you know, oh, you must Jaeger or Zipkin your entire system in order to get any value out, right? And it turns out that there is value in examining individual services, right? And being able to generate not distributed traces to, to understand what's happening inside of your systems. And I think, and I think that's true That's true of profiling too. And I think the other thing is reframing what is the value that we are getting out of this, right? I think that when we framed tracing as being only for problems that are, that are involving many different microservices, I think we kind of, we, we lost the plot a little bit. So let's think about what a modern approach to observability should look like. How should, how should, how should, we, be, how should we be integrating these various signal types together? I don't think the answer is, you know, you must have logs and you must have traces and you must have, right? Like at this point, we've hit a saturation point where people shouldn't have to collect them all like Pokemon. People shouldn't have to pay multiple times to store what's fundamentally the same kind of data. I, I think the right approach to me is, is that, yes, you know, there are similar to how there are separate use cases for for tracing, uh, were separate use cases for tracing versus, versus metrics uh, five, five years ago. 
yes, there is some value in using profiling to identify cost uh, improvements. But I don't think that that's, you know, a majority of software developers are not thinking about how much is this going to cost in production. What they're trying to do is understand, is this going to deliver a good user experience in production? Something that spins for an extra 500 milliseconds or extra two seconds is probably not going to break your bank, but it is going to result in blown service level objectives uh, and happy users. Um, and that's something that we ought to be able to, to fix. And we cannot expect people to wrap everything in a trace span, right? I, I, don't, I don't think that that's a reasonable presupposition. And I think that's an extension of the open telemetry auto instrumentation work to say, we should be able to auto instrument your code to the function level without you having to lift a finger, right? Like that the promise was that OTEL is going to give you request level tracing for free. Why shouldn't OTEL give you a function level tracing for free? Where the function level tracing is, is, is profiles that are highly, highly sampled, you know, per, you know, per, per one millisecond uh, increment. So that, you know, sure, you may, not, you may or may not get a sample for a request that runs less than 10 milliseconds, it's fine. But for a request that sits there spinning for, for two seconds, yeah, you'll statistically get, you know, at least 20 profiles out of that. That'll give you some, you know, 20, or if you're sampling every one millisecond, they're going to get, you know, 2,000 profiles, right? They'll, they'll tell you which line of code, which function, right? Like, which function is slow. And I think that's kind of how we connect the value of profiling to the average developer, is that the average developer needs to, right? Like, we... We live in a world of you build it, you run it, right? So developers should have service level objectives. Developers should be able to bug their service level objectives to understand where are things going south, right? Who, where, what, when, why, how. And part of that why and how is tracing and profiling. And that this is a new set of behaviors people are going to have to learn, but hopefully not a giant, a giant step if we can make the user experience smooth, right? If we can make it as seamless as, you know, for me at Google, going from a uh, metric heat map to a trace was, if we can make going from a trace to a profile is. That I think is the vision that I have for, for the future of, of observability is, you know, truly being able to debug any problem in production anywhere to the line of code, to the user um, and being able to fix it. It's pretty awesome. Thanks, Liz. All right, I think um, Liz was right on time. So um, I think let's open up. We have a few minutes if folks can just run over a bit. Um, questions? Uh, Go at it. I have one on, on the profiling. Go ahead, Ken. Um, because I, I recently went through the process of um, enabling profiling and I wonder what your stance is on not the runtime expense, like the, the time expense of profiling, but more also the, the like, it depends on language and, and what profiling, but I've seen a quite high memory cost of profiling in like using like pprof and stuff. So I wonder if like with the trace uh, um, open telemetry idea, if like we should be working on something that is a bit more lightweight, or if we can even work on something that's more lightweight than- yeah. What we have for like pprof and go for example is like expensive like crazy mm. uh, so i'm not necessarily the best person to to speak to that because full disclosure um when we ran pprof funnily enough on our main ingest service we discovered we were spending 10 percent of the of, of the of the process's time creating and sending trace spans right so right like we view that, at least at Honeycomb, as an acceptable <laughs> expense to spend 10% of our time generating trace. Because it turns out it enables us to debug high, high cardinality issues that we otherwise wouldn't be able to, right? So that is a choice that we have willingly made to sacrifice a little bit of performance for better visibility. Um, that being said, you know, if we really cared, we would head sample rather than tail sample the data, right? So we would not bother generating the trace spans in the first place. Uh, for, um, but instead, we choose to generate all of the data at source and then to tail sample it later. That is a choice that we have made. Um, I, I think, yes, you're right. Some organizations may not view investment in observability and kind of run and, and being willing to tolerate some runtime slowness in exchange for being able to see what's going on. Um, and I think that the way that we solve that is, you know, 
number one, as is the case with with uh, with tracing, right? Adjusting the head sample rate can really, really um, toggle that overhead versus versus granularity and fidelity. And I think the same is true for profiling, right? Like that you can choose what your profiling interval is, and that can really reduce the amount of memory, the amount of CPU that it consumes. But in practice, like you know, because profiling shows how much time you spend profiling and how much memory you spend profiling. Our analysis says that tracing is actually far more expensive than profiling um, in, ter in terms of uh, percentage CPU hit. Um, you know, even for the services where it's not as high volume of traces and therefore we're not, you know, spending 10% of our time mangling traces, you know, we'll see maybe a 2% hit from tracing and we'll maybe see less than a 0.5% hit from profiling. Um, so that's our experience um, and we continuously profile it, profile everything asterisk, uh, stupid go runtime bugs. Unfortunately, we've stumbled into a number of go runtime bugs because to our knowledge, we are some of the first people to be exercising a lot of these code paths in anger across like 100% of production. Um, but yeah, basically, and, and I think that's a question of maturity. I think that's a question of effort, right? Like if enough people are invested in in, in investigating this, if, pe if enough people are feeling this pain because they are, they're using this in anger, right? Like we'll, we'll get those bugs squashed pretty quick. But yeah, I think, I, I, I think in my view, it is worth it. And even if it is not worth it, you can always put it behind a feature flag, right? You can always turn on profiling uh, temporarily um, at varying rates. You know, you can increase the profiling rate or turn it from zero to, you know, one, one, one every 10 milliseconds even, right? It's just that limit of resolution, right? If you're profiling every 10 milliseconds, you're never going to catch your, uh, something that hangs for one millisecond. But if you're profiling every, every 10 milliseconds, you will get enough samples for, for something that happens every, you know, that, that blocks for two seconds. And I think that's an interesting point also with the, like, profiling on the open telemetry level that develop, developers could provide some way of information for the trace, like the instrumentation at the code yes. level to know this function will never, should never take more than X. So only create a span when it when it does stuff, stuff like that. Oof, that yeah, that, that, one, that one's a fun one because it's kind of a post facto knowledge thing, right? Right, like, uh, yeah. yeah. But you can, say, okay, right, like if I've had at least one call of this function take more than X seconds in the past uh, in the past five minutes, then I'm going to turn on increased sample rate for that, right? Like, so you can dynamically adjust, but you can't catch it post facto if you never traced it in the first place. Um, and I was yeah. kind of a disappointment, well, like to some extent expected, like in containerized environments, like in Kubernetes where containers have the memory limits, for example, and you want to dynamically enable, okay, let's trace this path, and your container keeps going out of memory because, uh, well, you, you, you switch the flag that uses more resources. So some of these feature yeah. flag changes sadly always involve restarts, which then trigger like, okay, that problem doesn't show up after you restart it anymore. Yeah, that's why I am, a, you know, I'm cautiously looking at uh, eBPF approaches that run in a sidecar rather than yeah. directly touching the process, right? Because that does allow that separation of instrumentation from uh, from the code that's un under under test. But I think that that is a maturity question, right? Like, you know, for all that I complain about PROF and and instability in the Go runtime, like, you know, it, it is at least a standard thing that is that is produced by the Go authors that is well supported ish. I'm very curious about eBPF with that, yeah. I haven't had time to look into it yet. Yep. Yeah, Daniel. The, the, uh, Daniel. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, Liz, great talk. Um, really appreciate your time. I, I have a question. You mentioned profiling is kind of where traces were on the maturity curve um, like a few years ago. And I'm wondering if you see. I guess what I'm wondering is, are the adoption sort of strategies that you can drive inside your organization, do you see any reflection there? Um, the reason I ask is like, I tried to introduce profiling and I think this is a bigger problem in like interpreted languages, like the usability is harder for the profiling tools. Um, I tried to introduce it a few years ago, locally didn't play nice with our test stack, right? Gave up for a little bit. Um, our vendor came out with a continuous profiling tool in production. I enabled it and immediately, even with the sample rate, drives our uh, usage on resources out of control. And also because it's a beta tool, poisons all of our metrics for the month. And that was kind of like after shot two, the organization was like, we're not using profiling anymore, right? Yeah. Um, where do you see like this, like, is it a safety question because you're playing with your like beta real up close in production? Is it a usability question? How do you see the curve going? 
it's 100% a usability question, right? Like, you know, with much love and respect to Jaeger for kind of paving the way of looking at a single trace, right? Like the value comes from being able to examine multiple traces in context, right? For tracing. So the value for profiling, right? Like profiling is never going to succeed if the only people who use it are the Brendan Greggs of the world, right? Are, are the performance engineers of the world, right? Like, you know, yes, you will have, right? Like, yes, you'll have organizations that think it's worth it for, you know, a select team of people to understand profiling, to be able to, you know, drive cost reductions. But like for a majority of organizations, the problem is not the cost of the AWS or Azure or GCP bill. The problem is that they're wasting developer time chasing down bugs, right? Like, why should we not be able to fix that, right? Like, so I think that when you articulate value that people can solve with that problem, and when you, the usability is such that the average dev can, 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 can use the tools, that, that, that's, when, that's when you get to that point, right? Like, and I don't, right, like, I don't think Jaeger crossed that chasm, right? Like, I, I at least, you know, Maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like I'm not aware of organizations where devs routinely look where where you know ordinary devs routinely look at Jaeger, right? Like you kind of have to have more layers of abstraction over the individual trace to be able to get value out of tracing. So similarly, you have to have more levels of abstraction over the profiles to be able to or to give people the carrot to then you know deal with the. Uh, pain of, of profiling. So we can both address this by kind of decreasing the pain the profiling causes. But also, I think the main thing is articulating value. If there's not value there, there's no incentive to work on the on the pain. And on the so cost. without with just to clarify, without like some sort of scale on the on the profiles that you can collect, like for example, uh, local profiling is uh, local profiling usability is not necessarily a goal uh, in your mind of any like uh, new profiling initiative. Like yeah, right. About. Like I I would say you know yes, if I am running go test bench. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll turn on, you know, go test bench pprof, right? And I'll go and look at the at, at, at the profiles in 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 go tool pprof. Absolutely, right. right? Like because I'm current I'm working on a benchmark right now. Right? But I think, you know, to me what the way I should be approaching this is not in terms of signals. The way I should be approaching this is what's the problem I'm trying to solve, right? And to me, mm -hmm. the biggest problem is I have a trace span, right? Like it used to be I have a request that's taking 5 seconds. Why is it taking 5 seconds, right? Oh, hey, it's a huge improvement to see what server it's coming from, right? And right. now it's I'm frustrated that I have, you know, that I have a request that's taking five seconds that's blocked in this individual request for two seconds. And why is it taking two seconds? Right. Like that's the motivating fire for me. Right. Like, and 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 then the profiling is the how, right? It's it's either profiling or you know, dynamically enabling trace spans uh, down progressive levels of function stack. But similar to how um, you know, exemplars take into an extreme approach, approach sampled traces. Uh, when you turn on trace spans on finer and finer levels of granularity that starts to approach profiling. And it turns out to be way more efficient to uh, profile instead of to in, in, instead of uh, creating trace scans for every function call. Right. Awesome. Thank you. So awesome. I, right, like one of my hopes is that the uh, OTEL profiling effort is going to standardize the agents, right? Is going to lower the overhead, is going to make it tunable, is make it correlatable to the open telemetry uh, span IDs, right? Like that a lot that you know, the mission statement when I think about, you know, when I think about should this project be an OTEL is, does this relate to signal collection and correlation to the common set of principles, right? Like, that's why, for instance, we accepted SQL commenter, right? Like, it's a, this is a trace propagation issue, right? Mm -hmm. So I think with, with profiling, it's a, this is a trace correlation issue for diagnosing things that go even, even further beyond, uh, beyond traces. Yeah. If there hadn't been that connection to tracing, right, it would, it would be like, okay, great, this is a performance tool, right? Why doesn't this belong with eBPF, right? Yep, yep, absolutely. And then that's a very good point, uh, Liz, to call out because I think that that's not clearly understood given the overuse of the word profiling itself. <laughs> so, right, that that, that, right, like it, it turns out that profiling and eBPF are correlated, right? But yeah. you can use them to solve slightly different problems, right? Like exactly. for instance, eBPF is more than just profiling. You can use eBPF to live debug things and look at variables, right? Conversely, yeah. you know, there are other ways besides eBPF to accomplish profiling, like, you know, runtime support for pprof, right? So it's kind of this overlapping Venn diagram circles. Um, totally, totally. And and that's a very good point. Um, I think we are a bit over time and two minutes to 10. So if folks have any one more question, maybe um, we can address. Otherwise, we can give wanna, a minute back. I don't want to have one last. Uh, what's your thought on uh, anomaly detection at collection or span profile creation time? Like, let's say you don't profile all the time, but if 
your metric expo exporter notices, hey, oh, this okay. off then to the standard, let's collect profiles. Like yeah, I, I think that's totally reasonable to turn on additional debugging. I made the face when you said anomaly detection because it's the, you know, jelly beans might cause cancer. Well, let's try green jelly beans. <laughs> let's try yellow jelly beans, right? Like the XKCD comic from like a week ago, right? Like I I, th I have a very dim of kind of post facto anomaly detection because I think it has a very high, a high false false positive rate because when you run 100 experiments, one of them is going to have a significance value of 0.1. Yep. Or 0 .01. Oh, not, so, not, not after a fact, but like at, yes. at the Point yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Run, run time, run time enabling of additional tracing or increasing sample rates or enabling profiling. I think that those are all the same category of when there is a problem, absolutely increase your resolution via whatever mechanism you can. Yeah. Right. Awesome. I Thanks. think we're at time. And Kevin, thank you again. Uh, Liz, again, deeply grateful that you could join today. Uh, and and uh, really appreciate everybody joining in a really awesome uh, talk today. Thank you. And we'll be posting the recording uh, right after it's available. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. See All you. right. Take Bye. care, everyone.